Chapter 26 of The Story Girl by L. M. Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26 Peter Makes an Impression. Peter's turn came next. He did not write his sermon out. That, he averred, was too hard work, nor did he mean to take a text. Why, who ever heard of a sermon without a text? asked Felix blankly. I am going to take a subject instead of a text said Peter loftily. I ain't going to tie myself down to a text, and I'm going to have heads in it, three heads. You hadn't a single head in yours. He added to me. Uncle Alex says that Uncle Edward says that heads are beginning to go out of fashion, I said defiantly, all the more defiantly that I felt I should have had heads in my sermon. It would doubtless have made a much deeper impression, but the truth was I had forgotten all about such things. Well, I'm going to have them, and I don't care if they are unfashionable, said Peter. They're good things. Aunt Jane used to say if a man didn't have heads and stick to them, he'd go wandering all over the Bible and never get anywhere in particular. What are you going to preach on? asked Felix. You'll find out next Sunday, said Peter significantly. The next Sunday was in October, and a lovely day it was, warm and bland as June. There was something in the fine, elusive air that recalled beautiful forgotten things and suggested delicate future hopes. The woods had wrapped fine woven gossamers about them, and the westering hill was crimson and gold. We sat around the pulpit stone and waited for Peter and Sarah Ray. It was the former's Sunday off, and he had gone home the night before, but he assured us he would be back in time to preach his sermon. Presently he arrived and mounted the granite boulder as if to the manor born. He was dressed in his new suit, and I, perceiving this, felt that he had the advantage of me. When I preached, I had to wear my second best suit, for it was one of Aunt Janet's laws that we should take our good suits off when we came home from church. There were, I saw, compensations for being a hired boy. Peter made quite a handsome little minister in his navy blue coat, white collar, and neatly bowed tie. His black eyes shone, and his black curls were brushed up in quite a ministerial pompadour, but threatened to tumble over at the top in graceless ringlets. It was decided that there was no use in waiting for Sarah Ray, who might or might not come, according to the humor in which her mother was. Therefore Peter proceeded with the service. He read the chapter and gave out the hymn, with as much sang Freud as if he had been doing it all his life. Mr. Marwood himself could not have bettered the way in which Peter said, We will sing the whole hymn, omitting the fourth stanza. That was a fine touch which I had not thought of. I began to think that, after all, Peter might be a full man worthy of my steel. When Peter was ready to begin, he thrust his hands into his pockets, a totally unorthodox thing. Then he plunged in without further ado, speaking in his ordinary conversational tone. Another unorthodox thing. There was no shorthand reporter present to take that sermon down, but, if necessary, I could preach it over verbatim, and so, I doubt not, could everyone that heard it. It was not a forgettable kind of sermon. Dearly beloved, said Peter, my sermon is about the bad place. In short, about hell. <gasps> An electric shock seemed to run through the audience. Everybody looked suddenly alert. Peter had, in one sentence, done what my whole sermon had failed to do. He had made an impression. I shall divide my sermon into three heads, pursued Peter. The first head is what you must not do if you don't want to go to the bad place. The second head is what the bad place is like. Sensation in the audience. And the third head is how to escape going there. Now there's a great many things you must not do, and it's very important to know what they are. You ought not to lose no time in finding out. In the first place, you mustn't ever forget to mind what grown-up people tell you. That is, good grown-up people. But how are you going to tell who are the good grown-up people? Asked Felix suddenly, forgetting that he was in church. Oh, that is easy, said Peter. You can always just feel who is good and who isn't. And you mustn't tell lies, and you mustn't murder anyone. You must be specially careful not to murder anyone. 
You might be forgiven for telling lies if you was real sorry for them, but if you murdered anyone it would be pretty hard to get forgiven, so you'd better be on the safe side. And you mustn't commit suicide, because if you did that you wouldn't have any chance of repenting it. And you mustn't forget to say your prayers, and you mustn't quarrel with your sister. At this point, Felicity gave Dan a significant poke with her elbow, and Dan was up in arms at once. Oh, don't you be preaching at me, Peter Craig, he cried out. I won't stand it. I don't quarrel with my sister any oftener than she quarrels with me. You can just leave me alone. Who's touching you? demanded Peter. I didn't mention no names. A minister can say anything he likes in the pulpit, as long as he doesn't mention any names and nobody can answer back. All right, but just you wait till tomorrow, growled Dan, subsiding reluctantly into silence under the reproachful looks of the girls. You must not play any games on Sunday, went on Peter. That is, any weekday games, or whisper in church, or laugh in church. I did that once, but I was awful sorry. And you mustn't take any notice of Paddy, I mean of the family cat at family prayers, not even if he climbs up on your back. And you mustn't call names or make faces. Amen cried Felix, who had suffered many things because Felicity had so often made faces at him. Peter stopped and glared at him over the edge of the pulpit stone. You haven't any business to call out a thing like that right in the middle of a sermon, he said. They do it in the Methodist church at Markdale, protested Felix, somewhat abashed. I heard them. I know they do. That's the Methodist way, and it is all right for them. I haven't a word to say against Methodists. My Aunt Jane was one, and I might have been one myself if I hadn't been so scared of the Judgment Day. But you ain't a Methodist. You're a Presbyterian, ain't you? Yes, of course. I was born that way. Very well, then. You've got to do things the Presbyterian way. Don't let me hear any more of your amens or I'll amen you. Oh, don't anybody interrupt again, implored the story girl. It isn't fair. How can anyone preach a good sermon if he is always being interrupted? Nobody interrupted Beverly. Bev didn't get up there and pitch into us like that, muttered Dan. You mustn't fight, resumed Peter undauntedly. That is, you mustn't fight for the fun of fighting, nor out of bad temper. You must not say bad words or swear. You mustn't get drunk. Although, of course, you wouldn't be likely to do that before you grow up, and the girls never. There's probably a good many other things you mustn't do, but these I've named are the most important. Of course, I'm not saying you'll go to the bad place for sure if you do them. I only say you're running a risk. The devil is looking out for the people who do these things, and he'll be more likely to get after them than to waste time over the people who don't do them. And that's all about the first head of my sermon. At this point, Sarah Ray arrived, somewhat out of breath. Peter looked at her reproachfully. You've missed my whole first head, Sarah, he said. That isn't fair when you're to be one of the judges. I think I ought to preach it over again for you. That was really done once. I know a story about it, said the story girl. Who's interrupting now, said Dan slyly. Never mind, tell us a story, said the preacher himself, eagerly leaning over the pulpit. It was Mr. Scott who did it, said the story girl. He was preaching somewhere in Nova Scotia, and when he was more than halfway through his sermon, and you know sermons were very long in those days, a man walked in. Mr. Scott stopped until he had taken his seat. Then he said, My friend, you are very late for this service. I hope you won't be late for heaven. The congregation will excuse me if I recapitulate the sermon for our friend's benefit. And then he just preached the sermon over again, from the beginning. It is said that that particular man was never known to be late for church again. It served him right, said Dan. But it was pretty hard lines on the rest of the congregation. Now let's be quiet so Peter can go on with his sermon, said Cecily. Peter squared his shoulders and took hold of the edge of the pulpit. Never a thump had he thumped, but I realized that his way of leaning forward and fixing this one or that one of his hearers with his eyes was much more effective. I've come now to the second head of my sermon, what the bad place is like. He proceeded to describe the bad place. Later on, we discovered that he had found his material in an illustrated translation of Dante's Inferno, which had once been given to his Aunt Jane as a school prize. But at the time, we supposed he must be drawing from biblical sources. Peter had been reading the Bible steadily ever since what we always referred to as the Judgment Sunday, and he was by now almost through it. 
None of the rest of us had ever read the Bible completely through, and we thought Peter must have found his description of the world of the lost in some portion with which we were not acquainted. Therefore, his utterances carried all the weight of inspiration, and we sat appalled before his lurid phrases. He used his own words to clothe the ideas he had found, and the result was a force and simplicity that struck home to our imaginations. Suddenly, Sarah Ray sprang to her feet with a scream. <laughs> a scream that changed into strange laughter. <laughs> we all, preacher included, looked at her aghast. <laughs> Cecily and Felicity sprang up and caught a hold of her. <laughs> Sarah Ray was really in a bad fit of hysterics. <laughs> but we knew nothing of such a thing in our experience. And we thought she had gone mad. She shrieked, <laughs> cried, laughed, and flung herself about. <laughs> She's going plain crazy, said Peter, coming down out of his pulpit with a very pale face. You frightened her crazy with your dreadful sermon, said Felicity indignantly. <laughs> she and Cecily each took Sarah by an arm and, half leading, half carrying, got her out of the orchard and up to the house. <laughs> the rest of us looked at each other in terrified questioning. You've made rather too much of an impression, Peter, said the story girl miserably. She needn't have got so scared. If she'd only waited for the third head, I'd have showed her how easy it was to get clear of going to the bad place and go to heaven instead. But you girls are always in such a hurry, said Peter bitterly. Do you suppose they'll have to take her to the asylum? Said Dan in a whisper. Hush, here's your father, said Felix. Uncle Alec came striding down the orchard. We had never before seen Uncle Alec angry. But there was no doubt that he was very angry. His blue eyes fairly blazed at us as he said, What have you been doing to frighten Sarah Ray into such a condition? We, we were just having a sermon contest, explained the story girl tremulously. And Peter preached about the bad place, and it frightened Sarah. That is all, Uncle Alec. All? I don't know what the result will be to that nervous, delicate child. She is shrieking in there, and nothing will quiet her. What do you mean by playing such a game on Sunday? and making a jest of sacred things no not a word for the story girl had attempted to speak you and peter march off home and the next time i find you up to such doings on a sunday or any other day i'll give you cause to remember it to your latest hour the story girl and peter went humbly home and we went with them I can't understand grown-up people, said Felix despairingly. When Uncle Edward preached sermons, it was all right. But when we do it, it is making a jest of sacred things. And I heard Uncle Alec tell a story once about being nearly frightened to death when he was a little boy by a minister preaching on the end of the world. And he said, that was something like a sermon. You don't hear such sermons nowadays. But when Peter preaches just such a sermon, it's a very different story. It's no wonder we can't understand the grown-ups, said the story girl indignantly. Because we've never been grown-up ourselves, but they have been children, and I don't see why they can't understand us. Of course, perhaps we shouldn't have had the contest on Sundays. But all the same, I think it's mean of Uncle Alec to be so cross. Oh, I do hope poor Sarah won't have to be taken to the asylum. Poor Sarah did not have to be. She was eventually quieted down and was as well as usual the next day, and she humbly begged Peter's pardon for spoiling his sermon. Peter granted it rather grumpily, and I fear that he never really quite forgave Sarah for her untimely outburst. Felix, too, felt resentment against her, because he had lost the chance of preaching his sermon. Of course I know I wouldn't have got the prize, for I couldn't have made such an impression as Peter, he said to us mournfully. 
but I'd like to have had a chance to show what I could do. That's what comes of having those crybaby girls mixed up in things. Cecily was just as scared as Sarah Ray, but she'd more sense than to show it like that. Well, Sarah couldn't help it, said the story girl charitably. But it does seem as if we'd had dreadful luck in everything we've tried lately. I thought of a new game this morning, but I'm almost afraid to mention it, for I suppose something dreadful will come of it, too. Oh, oh tell, tell us, what, what is, is it? it? Everybody entreated. Well, it's a trial by ordeal, and we're to see which of us can pass it. The ordeal is to eat one of the bitter apples in big mouthfuls without making a single face. Dan made a face to begin with. I don't believe any of us can do that, he said. You can't if you take bites big enough to fill your mouth, giggled Felicity with cruelty and without provocation. Well, maybe you could, retorted Dan sarcastically. You'd be so afraid of spoiling your looks that you'd rather die than make a face, I suppose, no matter what you ate. Felicity makes enough faces when there's nothing to make faces at, said Felix, who had been grimaced at over the breakfast table that morning and hadn't liked it. I think the bitter apples would be real good for Felix, said Felicity. They say sour things make people thin. Let's go and get the bitter apples, said Cecily hastily. Seeing that Felix, Felicity, and Dan were on the verge of a quarrel more bitter than the apples. We went to the seedling tree and got an apple apiece. The game was that everyone must take a bite in turn, chew it up, and swallow it without making a face. Peter again distinguished himself. He and he alone passed the ordeal, munching those dreadful mouthfuls without so much as a change of expression on his countenance while the facial contortions of the rest of us went through baffled description. In every subsequent trial it was the same. Peter never made a face, and no one else could help making them. It sent him up fifty percent in Felicity's estimation. Peter is a real smart boy, she said to me. It's such a pity he is a hired boy. But if we could not pass the ordeal, we got any amount of fun out of it at least. Evening after evening, the orchard re-echoed to our peals of laughter. <laughs> Bless the children, said Uncle Alec as he carried the milk pails across the yard. Nothing can quench their spirits for long. End of chapter 26《Chapter 27 of the Story Girl by L. M. Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27 The Ordeal of Bitter Apples. I could never understand why Felix took Peter's success in the ordeal of bitter apples so much to heart. He had not felt very keenly over the matter of the sermons, and certainly the mere fact that Peter could eat sour apples without making faces did not cast any reflection on the honor or ability of the other competitors. But to Felix, everything suddenly became flat, stale, and unprofitable, because Peter continued to hold the championship of bitter apples. It haunted his waking hours and obsessed his nights. I heard him talking in his sleep about it. If anything could have made him thin, the way he worried over this matter would have done it. For myself, I cared not a groat. I had wished to be successful in the sermon contest and felt sore whenever I thought of my failure, but I had no burning desire to eat sour apples without grimacing, and I did not sympathize over and above with my brother. When, however, he took to praying about it, I realized how deeply he felt on the subject and hoped he would be successful. Felix prayed earnestly that he might be enabled to eat a bitter apple without making a face. And when he had prayed three nights after this manner, he contrived to eat a bitter apple without a grimace until he came to the last bite, which proved too much for him. But Felix was vastly encouraged. Another prayer or two, and I'll be able to eat a whole one, he said jubilantly. But this devoutly desired consummation 
did not come to pass. In spite of prayers and heroic attempts, Felix could never get beyond that last bite. Not even faith and works in combination could avail. For a time he could not understand this, but he thought the mystery was solved when Cecily came to him one day and told him that Peter was praying against him. He's praying that you will never be able to eat a better apple without making a face, she said. He told Felicity and Felicity told me. She said she thought it was real cute of him. I think that is a dreadful way to talk about praying and I told her so. She wanted me to promise not to tell you, but I wouldn't promise because I think it's fair for you to know what's going on. Felix was very indignant and aggrieved as well. I don't see why God should answer Peter's prayers instead of mine, he said bitterly. I've gone to church and Sunday school all my life, and Peter never went till this summer. It isn't fair. Oh, Felix, don't talk like that, said Cecily, shocked. God must be fair. I'll tell you what I believe is the reason. Peter prays three times a day regular, in the morning and at dinner and at night. And besides that, any time through the day when he happens to think of it, he just prays, standing up. Did you ever hear of such goings on? Well, he's got to stop praying against me anyhow, said Felix resolutely. I won't put up with it, and I'll go tell him so right off. Felix marched over to Uncle Roger's, and we trailed after, scenting a scene. We found Peter shelling beans in the granary and whistling cheerily, as with a conscience void of offense toward all men. Look here, Peter, said Felix ominously. They tell me that you've been praying right along that I couldn't eat a bitter apple. Now I tell you. I never did, exclaimed Peter indignantly. I never mentioned your name. I never prayed that you couldn't eat a bitter apple. I just prayed that I'd be the only one that could. Well, that's the same thing, cried Felix. You've just been praying for the opposite to me out of spite. And you've got to stop it, Peter Craig. Well, I just guess I won't said Peter angrily. I've just as good a right to pray for what I want as you, Felix King, even if he was brought up in Toronto. I suppose you think a hired boy hasn't any business to pray for particular things, but I'll show you. I'll just pray for what I please, and I'd like to see you try and stop me. You'll have to fight me if you keep on praying against me, said Felix. <gasps> the girls gasped. But Dan and I were jubilant, snuffing battle afar off. All right, I can fight as well as pray. Oh, don't fight, implored Cecily. I think it would be dreadful. Surely you can arrange it some other way. Let's all give up the ordeal anyway. There isn't much fun in it, and then neither of you need pray about it. I don't want to give up the ordeal, said Felix. And I won't. Oh, well, surely you can settle it some other way without fighting, persisted Cecily. I'm not wanting to fight, said Peter. It's Felix. If he don't interfere with my prayers, there's no need of fighting. But if he does, there's no other way to settle it. But how will that settle it? Asked Cecily. Oh, whoever's licked will have to give in about the praying, said Peter. That's fair enough. If I'm licked, I won't pray for that particular thing any more. It's dreadful to fight about anything so religious as praying, sighed poor Cecily. Why? They are always fighting about religion in old times, said Felix. The more religious anything was the more fighting there was about it. A fellow's got a right to pray as he pleases, said Peter. And if anybody tries to stop him, he's bound to fight. That's my way of looking at it. What would Miss Marwood say if she knew you were going to fight? Asked Felicity. Miss Marwood was Felix's Sunday school teacher, and he was very fond of her. But by this time, Felix was quite reckless. I don't care what she would say, he retorted. Felicity tried another tack. You'll be sure to get whipped if you fight with Peter, she said. You're too fat to fight. After that, no moral force on earth could have prevented Felix from fighting. He would have faced an army with banners. You might settle it by drawing lots, said Cecily desperately. Drawing lots is wickeder than fighting, said Dan. It's a kind of gambling. What would Aunt Jane say if she knew you were going to fight? Cecily demanded of Peter. Don't you drag my Aunt Jane into this affair, said Peter darkly. 
You said you were going to be a Presbyterian, persisted Cecily. Good Presbyterians do not fight. Oh, don't they? I heard your Uncle Roger say that Presbyterians were the best for fighting in the world. Or the worst, I forget what she said, but it means the same thing. Cecily had but one more shot in her locker. I thought you said in your sermon, Master Peter, that people shouldn't fight. I said they oughtn't to fight for fun or for bad temper, retorted Peter. This is different. I know what I'm fighting for, but I can't think of the word. I guess you mean principle, I suggested. Yes, that's it, agreed Peter. It's all right to fight for principle. It's kind of praying with your fists. Oh, can't you do something to prevent them from fighting, Sarah? Pleaded Cecily, turning to the story girl, who was sitting on a bin, swinging her shapely bare feet to and fro. It doesn't do to meddle in an affair of this kind between boys, said the story girl sagely. I may be mistaken, but I do not believe the story girl wanted that fight stopped. And I am far from being sure that Felicity did either. It was ultimately arranged that the combat should take place in the firwood behind Uncle Roger's granary. It was a nice, remote, bosky place, where no prowling grown-ups would be likely to intrude. And thither we all resorted at sunset. I hope Felix will beat, said the story girl to me. Not only for the family honor, but because that was a mean, mean prayer of Peter's. Do you think he will? I don't know, I confessed dubiously. Felix is too fat. He'll get out of breath in no time. And Peter is such a cool customer, and he's a year older than Felix. But then Felix has had some practice. He has fought boys in Toronto, and this is Peter's first fight. Did you ever fight? asked the story girl. Once, I said briefly, dreading the next question which promptly came. Who beat? It is sometimes a bitter thing to tell the truth, especially to a young lady for whom you have a great admiration. I had a struggle with temptation in which I frankly confess I might have been worsted had it not been for a saving and timely remembrance of a certain resolution made on the day preceding Judgment Sunday. The other fellow, I said with reluctant honesty. Well, said the story girl. I think it doesn't matter whether you get whipped or not, so long as you fight a good square fight. Her potent voice made me feel that I was quite the hero after all. And the sting went out of my recollection of that old fight. When we arrived behind the granary, the others were all there. Cecily was very pale, and Felix and Peter were taking off their coats. There was a pure yellow sunset that evening and the aisles of the firwood were flooded with its radiance. A cool autumn wind was whistling among the dark boughs and scattering blood-red leaves from the maple at the end of the granary. Now, said Dan, I'll count, and when I say three, you pitch in and hammer each other until one of you has had enough. <laughs> Cecily, keep quiet. Now, one, two, three. Peter and Felix Ooh. pitched in. <laughs> with more zeal than discretion on both sides. As a result, Peter got what later developed into a black eye, and Felix's nose began to bleed. Cecily gave a shriek and ran out of the wood. We thought she had fled because she could not endure the sight of blood, and we were not sorry, for her manifest disapproval and anxiety were dampening the excitement of the occasion. Felix and Peter drew apart after that first onset and circled about one another warily. Then, just as they had come to grips again, Uncle Alec walked around the corner of the granary with Cecily behind him. He was not angry. There was a quizzical look in his eyes. But he took the combatants by their shirt collars and dragged them apart. This stops right here, boys, he said. You know I don't allow fighting. Oh, but Uncle Alec, it was this way, began Felix eagerly. Peter? No, I don't want to hear about it, said Uncle Alec sternly. I don't care what you were fighting about, but you must settle your quarrels in a different fashion. Remember my commands, Felix. Peter? 
Roger is looking for you to wash his buggy. Be off. Peter went off rather sullenly, and Felix, also sullenly, sat down and began to nurse his nose. He turned his back on Cecily. Cecily caught it after Uncle Alec had gone. Dan called her a telltale and a baby and sneered at her until Cecily began to cry. <laughs> I couldn't stand by and watch Felix and Peter pound each other all to pieces, she sobbed. They've been such friends, and it was dreadful to see them fighting. Uncle Roger would have let them fight it out, said the story girl discontentedly. Uncle Roger believes in boys fighting. He says it's as harmless a way as any of working off their original sin. Peter and Felix wouldn't have been any worse friends after it. They'd have been better friends, because the praying question would have been settled. And now it can't be, unless Felicity can coax Peter to give up praying against Felix. For once in her life, the story girl was not as tactful as her wont. Or, is it possible that she said it out of malice prepense? At all events, Felicity resented the imputation that she had more influence with Peter than anyone else. I don't meddle with hired boys' prayers she said haughtily. It was all nonsense fighting about such prayers anyhow, said Dan, who probably thought that since all chance of a fight was over, he might as well avow his real sentiments as to its folly. Just as much nonsense as praying about the bitter apples in the first place. Oh, Dan, don't you believe there is some good in praying? said Cecily reproachfully. Yes, I believe there's some good in some sorts of praying, but not in that kind said Dan sturdily. I don't believe God cares whether anybody can eat an apple without making a face or not. I don't believe it's right to talk of God as if you were well acquainted with him, said Felicity, who felt that it was a good chance to snub Dan. There's something wrong somewhere, said Cecily perplexedly. We ought to pray for what we want, of that I'm sure. And Peter wanted to be the only one who could pass the ordeal. It seems as if he must be right. And yet it doesn't seem so. I wish I could understand it. Peter's prayer was wrong because it was a selfish prayer, I guess, said the story girl thoughtfully. Felix's prayer was all right because it wouldn't have hurt anyone else. But it was selfish of Peter to want to be the only one. We mustn't pray selfish prayers. Oh, I see through it now, said Cecily joyfully. Yes, but, said Dan triumphantly. If you believe God answers prayers about particular things, it was Peter's prayer he answered. What do you make of that? Oh. The story girl shook her head impatiently. There's no use in trying to make such things out. We only get more mixed up all the time. Let's leave it alone and I'll tell you a story. Aunt Olivia had a letter today from a friend in Nova Scotia who lives in Shubenacadie. When I said I thought it a funny name, she told me to go and look in her scrapbook, and I would find a story about the origin of the name. And I did. Don't you want to hear it? Of course we did. We sat down at the roots of the firs. Felix, having finally squared matters with his nose, turned around and listened also. He would not look at Cecily, but everyone else had forgiven her. The story girl leaned that brown head of hers against the fir trunk behind her, and looked up at the apple-green sky through the dark boughs above us. She wore, I remember, a dress of warm crimson, and she had wound around her head a string of waxberries that looked like a fillet of pearls. Her cheeks were still flushed with the excitement of the evening. In the dim light she was beautiful, with a wild mystic loveliness, a compelling charm that would not be denied. Many, many moons ago, an Indian tribe lived on the banks of a river in Nova Scotia. One of the young braves was named Acadie. He was the tallest and bravest and handsomest young man in the tribe. Why is it that they're always so handsome in stories? asked Dan. Why are there never no stories about ugly people? Perhaps ugly people never have stories happen to them, suggested Felicity. I think they're just as interesting as the handsome people, retorted Dan. Well, maybe they are in real life said Cecily. But in stories, it's just as easy to make them handsome as not. I like them best that way. I just love to read a story where the heroine is beautiful as a dream. Pretty people are always conceited, said Felix, who was getting tired of holding his tongue. The heroes in stories are always nice, 
said Felicity, with apparent irrelevance. They're always so tall and slender. Wouldn't it be awful funny if anyone wrote a story about a fat hero, or about one with too big a mouth? It doesn't matter what a man looks like, I said, feeling that Felix and Dan were catching it rather too hotly. He must be a good sort of chap, and do heaps of things. That's all that's necessary. Do any of you happen to want to hear the rest of my story? Asked the story girl in an ominously polite voice that recalled us to a sense of our bad manners. We apologized and promised to behave better. She went on, appeased. Acadie was all these things that I have mentioned, and he was the best hunter in the tribe besides. Never an arrow of his that did not go straight to the mark. Many and many a snow-white moose he shot, and gave the beautiful skin to his sweetheart. Her name was Shubin, and she was as lovely as the moon when it rises from the sea, and as pleasant as a summer twilight. Her eyes were dark and soft, her foot was as light as a breeze, and her voice sounded like a brook in the woods, or the wind that comes over the hills at night. She and Akadi were very much in love with each other, and often they hunted together, for Shubin was almost as skillful with her bow and arrow as Akadi himself. They had loved each other ever since they were small papooses, and they had vowed to love each other as long as the river ran. One twilight, when Akadi was out hunting in the woods, he shot a snow-white moose, and he took off its skin and wrapped it around him. Then he went on through the woods in the starlight, and he felt so happy and light of heart that he sometimes frisked and capered about just as a real moose would do. And he was doing this when Shubin, who was also out hunting, saw him from afar and thought he was a real moose. She stole cautiously through the woods until she came to the brink of a little valley. Below her stood the snow-white moose. She drew her arrow to her eye. Alas, she knew the art only too well, and took careful aim. The next moment Akadi fell, dead, with her arrow in his heart. The story girl paused, a dramatic pause. It was quite dark in the fir wood. We could see her face and eyes but dimly through the gloom. A silvery moon was looking down on us over the granary. The stars twinkled through the soft waving boughs. Beyond the wood we caught a glimpse of the moonlit world lying in the sharp frost of the October evening. The sky above it was chill and ethereal and mystical. But all about us were shadows and the weird little tale told in a voice fraught with mystery and pathos, had peopled them for us with furtive folk in belt and wampum and dark-tressed Indian maidens. What did Shubin do when she found out she had killed Acadie? asked Felicity. She died of a broken heart before the spring, and she and Acadie were buried side by side on the bank of the river, which has ever since borne their names, the river Shubin Acadie, said the story girl. The sharp wind blew around the granary and Cecily shivered. We heard Aunt Janet's voice calling, Children! Children! Shaking off the spell of furs and moonlight and romantic tale, we scrambled to our feet and went homeward. I kind of wish I'd been born in Injun, said Dan. It must have been a jolly life. Nothing to do but hunt and fight. It wouldn't be so nice if they caught you and tortured you at the stake, said Felicity. No, said Dan reluctantly. I suppose there'd be some drawback to everything, even being an Injun. Isn't it cold? said Cecily, shivering again. It will soon be winter. I wish summer could last forever. Felicity likes winter, and so does the story girl, but I don't. It always seems so long till spring. Never mind. We've had a splendid summer, I said slipping my arm about her to comfort some childish sorrow that breathed in her plaintive voice. Truly, we had had a delectable summer, and having had it, it was ours forever. The gods themselves cannot recall their gifts. They may rob us of our future and embitter our present, but our past they may not touch. With all its laughter and delight and glamour, it is our eternal possession. Nevertheless, we all felt a little of the sadness of the waning year. There was a distinct weight on our spirits until Felicity took us into the pantry 
and stayed us with apple tarts and comforted us with cream. Then we brightened up. It was really a very decent world after all. End of chapter 27「Chapter Twenty Eight of the Story Girl by L. M. Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Eight: The Tale of the Rainbow Bridge. Felix, so far as my remembrance goes, never attained to success in the ordeal of bitter apples. He gave up trying after a while, and he also gave up praying about it, saying in bitterness of spirit that there was no use in praying when other fellows prayed against you out of spite. He and Peter remained on bad terms for some time, however. We were all of us too tired those nights to do any special praying. Sometimes I fear our regular prayers were slurred over, or mumbled in anything but reverent haste. October was a busy month on the hill farms. The apples had to be picked, and this work fell mainly to us children. We stayed home from school to do it. It was pleasant work, and there was a great deal of fun in it. But it was hard, too, and our arms and backs ached roundly at night. In the mornings it was very delightful, in the afternoons tolerable, but in the evenings we lagged, and the laughter and zest of fresher hours were lacking. Some of the apples had to be picked very carefully, but with others it didn't matter. We boys would climb the trees and shake the apples down until the girls shrieked for mercy. The days were crisp and mellow, with warm sunshine and a tang of frost in the air, mingled with the woodsy odors of the withering grasses. The hens and turkeys prowled about, pecking at windfalls, and Pat made mad rushes at them amid the fallen leaves. The world beyond the orchard was in a royal magnificence of coloring under the vivid blue autumn sky. The big willow by the gate was a splendid golden dome and the maples that were scattered through the spruce grove waved blood-red banners over the somber cone-bearers. The story girl generally had her head garlanded with their leaves. They became her vastly. Neither Felicity nor Cecily could have worn them. Those two girls were of a domestic type that assorted ill with the wild fire in nature's veins. But when the story girl wreathed her nut-brown tresses with crimson leaves, it seemed, as Peter said, that they grew on her, as if the golden flame of her spirit had broken out in a coronal, as much a part of her as the pale halo seems a part of the Madonna it encircles. What tales she told us on those faraway autumn days, people in the russet arcades with folk of an elder world. Many a princess rode by us on her palfrey, Many a swaggering gallant ruffled it bravely in velvet and plume adown Uncle Stephen's walk. Many a stately lady, silken clad, walked in that opulent orchard. When we had filled our baskets, they had to be carried to the granary loft, and the contents stored in bins or spread on the floor to ripen further. We ate a good many, of course, feeling that the laborer was worthy of his hire. The apples from our own birthday trees were stored in separate barrels, inscribed with our names. We might dispose of them as we willed. Felicity sold hers to Uncle Alec's hired man, and was badly cheated to boot, for he levanted shortly afterwards, taking the apples with him, having paid her only half her rightful due. Felicity has not gotten over that to this day. Cecily, dear heart, sent most of hers to the hospital in town, and no doubt gathered in therefrom dividends of gratitude and satisfaction of soul, such as can never be purchased in any mere process of bargain and sale. The rest of us ate our apples, or carried them to school, where we bartered them for such treasures as our schoolmates possessed and we coveted. There was a dusky little pear-shaped apple from one of Uncle Stephen's trees, which was our favorite and next to it a delicious juicy yellow apple from Aunt Louise's tree. We were also fond of the big sweet apples. We used to throw them up in the air and let them fall on the ground until they were bruised and battered to the bursting point. Then we sucked on the juice. Sweeter was it than the nectar drunk by the blissful gods on the Thessalian hill. 
Sometimes we worked until the cold yellow sunsets faded out over the darkening distances, and the hunter's moon looked down on us through the sparkling air. The constellations of autumn scintillated above us. Peter and the story girl knew all about them and imparted their knowledge to us generously. I recall Peter standing on the pulpit stone one night ere moonrise and pointing them out to us, occasionally having a difference of opinion with the story girl over the name of some particular star. Job's coffin and the Northern Cross were to the west of us. South of us flamed Fomalo. The great square of Pegasus was over our heads. Cassiopeia sat enthroned in her beautiful chair in the northeast, and north of us the dippers swung untiringly around the pole star. Cecily and Felix were the only ones who could distinguish the double star in the handle of the Big Dipper, and greatly did they plume themselves thereon. The story girl told us myths and legends woven around these immemorial clusters, her very voice taking on a clear, remote, starry sound as she talked of them. When she ceased, we came back to Earth feeling as if we had been millions of miles away, in the blue ether, and that all our old familiar surroundings were momentarily forgotten and strange. That night, when he pointed out the stars to us from the pulpit stone, was the last time for several weeks that Peter shared our toil and pastime. The next day he complained of headache and sore throat and seemed to prefer lying on Aunt Olivia's kitchen sofa to doing any work. As it was not in Peter to be a malingerer, he was left in peace while we picked apples. Felix alone, most unjustly and spitefully, declared that Peter was simply shirking. He's just lazy. That's what's the matter with him, he said. Why don't you talk sense if you must talk, said Felicity. There's no sense in calling Peter lazy. You might as well say I had black hair. Of course, Peter, being a Craig, has his faults, but he's a smart boy. His father was lazy, but his mother hasn't a lazy bone in her body, and Peter takes after her. Uncle Roger says Peter's father wasn't exactly lazy, said the story girl. The trouble was, there were so many other things he liked better than work. I wonder if he'll ever come back to his family, said Cecily. Just think how dreadful it would be if our father had left us like that. Our father is a king, said Felicity loftily. And Peter's father was only a crag. A member of our family couldn't behave like that. They say there must be a black sheep in every family, said the story girl. There isn't any in ours, said Cecily loyally. Why do white sheep eat more than black? asked Felix. Is that a conundrum? asked Cecily cautiously. If it is, I won't try to guess the reason. I never can guess conundrums. It isn't a conundrum, said Felix. It's a fact. They do. And there's a good reason for it. We stopped picking apples, sat down in the grass, and tried to reason it out, with the exception of Dan, who declared that he knew there was a catch somewhere. And he wasn't going to be caught. The rest of us could not see where any catch could exist, since Felix solemnly vowed, cross his heart, White sheep did eat more than black. We argued over it seriously, but finally had to give it up. Well, what is the reason? asked Felicity. Because there's more of them, <laughs> said Felix, grinning. I forget what we did to Felix. A shower came up in the evening, and we had to stop picking. After the shower, there was a magnificent double rainbow. We watched it from the granary window, and the story girl told us an old legend, culled from one of Aunt Olivia's mini scrapbooks. Long, long ago, in the Golden Age, when the gods used to visit the earth so often that it was nothing uncommon to see them, Odin made a pilgrimage over the world. Odin was the great god of the Northland, you know. And wherever he went among men, he taught them love and brotherhood and skillful arts, and great cities sprang up where he had trodden, and every land through which he passed was blessed because one of the gods had come down to men. But many men and women followed Odin himself, giving up all their worldly possessions and ambitions, and to these he promised the gift of eternal life, 
All these people were good and noble and unselfish and kind, but the best and noblest of them all was a youth named Ving, and this youth was beloved by Odin above all others, for his beauty and strength and goodness. Always he walked on Odin's right hand, and always the first light of Odin's smile fell on him. Tall and straight was he as a young pine, and his long hair was the color of ripe wheat in the sun, and his blue eyes were like the Northland heavens on a starry night. In Odin's band was a beautiful maiden named Aileen. She was as fair and delicate as a young birch tree in spring, among the dark old pines and firs, and Ving loved her with all his heart. His soul thrilled with rapture at the thought that he and she together should drink from the fountain of immortality, as Odin had promised, and be one thereafter in eternal youth. At last they came to the very place where the rainbow touched the earth, and the rainbow was a great bridge, built of living colors, so dazzling and wonderful that beyond it the eye could see nothing, only far away a great, blinding, sparkling glory, where the fountain of life sprang up in a shower of diamond fire but under the rainbow bridge rolled a terrible flood, deep and wide and violent, full of rocks and rapids and whirlpools. There was a warder at the bridge, a god, dark and stern and sorrowful, and to him Odin gave command that he should open the gate and allow his followers to cross the rainbow bridge, that they might drink of the fountain of life beyond, and the warder set open the gate. "'Pass on and drink of the fountain,' he said. To all who taste of it shall immortality be given, but only to the one who shall drink of it first shall be permitted to walk at Odin's right hand forever. Then the company passed through in great haste, all fired with a desire to be the first to drink of the fountain and win so marvelous a boon. Last of all came Ving. He had lingered behind to pluck a thorn from the foot of a beggar child he had met on the highway, and he had not heard the warder's words. But when, eager, joyous, radiant, he set his foot on the rainbow, the stern, sorrowful warder took him by the arm and drew him back. Ving, strong, noble, and valiant, he said, Rainbow Bridge is not for thee. Very dark grew Ving's face. Hot rebellion rose in his heart and rushed over his pale lips. Why dost thou keep back the draught of immortality from me? he demanded passionately. The warder pointed to the dark flood that rolled under the bridge. The path of the rainbow is not for thee, he said, but yonder way is open. Ford that flood, on the furthest bank is the fountain of life. Thou mockest me, muttered Ving sullenly. No mortal could cross that flood. O oh, master, he prayed, turning beseechingly to Odin, thou didst promise to me eternal life as to the others. Wilt thou not keep that promise? Command the warder to let me pass. He must obey thee. But Odin stood silent, with his face turned from his beloved, and Ving's heart was filled with unspeakable bitterness and despair. "'Thou mayest return to earth if thou fearest to assay the flood,' said the warder. "'Nay,' said Ving wildly, "'earthly life without a lean is more dreadful than the death which awaits me in yon dark river.' And he plunged fiercely in. He swam and struggled, he buffeted the turmoil. The waves went over his head again and again, the whirlpools caught him and flung him on the cruel rocks, the wild cold spray beat on his eyes and blinded him, so that he could see nothing, and the roar of the river deafened him, so that he could hear nothing. But he felt keenly the wounds and bruises of the cruel rocks, and many a time he would have given up the struggle had not the thought of sweet Aileen's loving eyes brought him the strength and desire to struggle as long as it was possible. Long, long, long to him seemed that bitter and perilous passage, but at last he won through to the furthest side. Breathless and reeling, his vesture torn, his great wounds bleeding, he found himself on the shore where the fountain of immortality sprang up. He staggered to its brink and drank of its clear stream. Then all pain and weariness fell away from him, and there he rose up, a god, beautiful with immortality. And as he did there came rushing over the rainbow bridge a great company, the band of fellow travellers. But all were too late to win the double boon. Ving had won to it through the danger and suffering of the dark river. The rainbow had faded out, and the darkness of the October dust was falling. I wonder said Dan meditatively, as we went away from that redolent spot. What it would be like to live forever in this world. I expect we'd get tired of it after a while, said the story girl. But, 
she added. I think it would be a goodly while before I would. End of chapter 28「Chapter Twenty Nine of the Story Girl by L. M. Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Nine The Shadow Feared of Man. We were all up early the next morning, dressing by candlelight, but early as it was, we found the Story Girl in the kitchen when we went down, sitting on Rachel Ward's blue chest and looking important. What do you think? she exclaimed. Peter has the measles. He was dreadfully sick all night, and Uncle Roger had to go for the doctor. He was quite light-headed, and didn't know anyone. Of course he's far too sick to be taken home, so his mother has come up to wait on him, and I'm to live over here until he is better. This was mingled bitter and sweet. We were sorry to hear that Peter had the measles, but it would be jolly good to have the story girl living with us all the time. What orgies of storytelling we should have! I suppose we'll all have the measles now, grumbled Felicity. And October is such an inconvenient time for measles. There's so much to do. I don't believe any time is very convenient to have the measles, Cecily said. Oh, perhaps we won't have them, said the story girl cheerfully. Peter caught them at Markdale the last time he was home, his mother says. I don't want to catch the measles from Peter, said Felicity decidedly. Fancy catching them from a hired boy. Oh, Felicity, don't call Peter a hired boy when he's sick, protested Cecily. During the next two days we were very busy. Only in the frosty dusk did we have time to wander afar in the realms of gold with the story girl. She had recently been digging into a couple of old volumes of classic myths and Northland folklore, which she had found in Aunt Olivia's attic. And for us, God and Goddess... Laughing nymph and mocking satyr, Norn and Valkyrie, elf and troll, and green folk generally, were real creatures once again, inhabiting the orchards and woods and meadows around us, until it seemed as if the Golden Age had returned to earth. Then, on the third day, the story girl came to us with a very white face. She had been over to Uncle Roger's yard to hear the latest bulletin from the sick room. Hitherto they had been of a non-committal nature, but now it was only too evident that she had bad news. Peter is very, very sick, she said miserably. He has caught cold some way, and the measles have struck in, and, and... The story girl wrung her brown hands together. The doctor is afraid he... He won't get better. We all stood around, stricken, incredulous. Do you mean? Said Felix, finding voice at length. That Peter is going to die? The story girl nodded miserably. They're afraid so. Cecily sat down by her half-filled basket and began to cry. Felicity said violently that she didn't believe it. I can't pick another apple today, and I ain't gonna try, said Dan. None of us could. We went to the grown-ups and told them so, and the grown-ups, with unaccustomed understanding and sympathy, told us that we need not. Then we roamed about in our wretchedness and tried to comfort one another. We avoided the orchard. It was for us too full of happy memories to accord with our bitterness of soul. Instead, we resorted to the spruce wood, where the hush and the somber shadows and the soft, melancholy sign of the wind and the branches over us did not jar harshly on our new sorrow. We could not really believe that Peter was going to die. To die. Old people died. Grown-up people died. Even children of whom we had heard died. But that one of us, of our merry little band, should die. 
was unbelievable. We could not believe it, and yet the possibility struck us in the face like a blow. We sat on the mossy stones under the dark old evergreens and gave ourselves up to wretchedness. <laughs> we all, even Dan, <laughs> cried. <laughs> <laughs> Except the story girl. I don't see how you can be so unfeeling, Sarah Stanley, said Felicity reproachfully. You've always been such friends with Peter, and made out you thought so much of him. And now you ain't shedding a tear for him. I looked at the story girl's dry, piteous eyes, and suddenly remembered that I had never seen her cry. When she told us sad tales, in a voice laden with all the tears that had ever been shed, she had never shed one of her own. I can't cry, she said drearily. I wish I could. I have a dreadful feeling here. She touched her slender throat. And if I could cry, I think it would make it better. But I can't. Maybe Peter will get better after all, said Dan, swallowing a sob. I've heard of lots of people who went and got better after the doctor said they were going to die. While there's life, there's hope, you know, said Felix. We shouldn't cross bridges till we come to them. Those are only proverbs, said the story girl bitterly. Proverbs are all very fine when there's nothing to worry you, but when you're in real trouble, they're not a bit of help. Oh, I wish I'd never said Peter wasn't fit to associate with, moaned Felicity. If he ever gets better, I'll never say such a thing again. I'll never think it. He's such a lovely boy and twice as smart as lots that aren't hired out. He was always so polite and good-natured and obliging, sighed Cecily. He was just a real gentleman, said the story girl. There ain't many fellows as fair and square as Peter, said Dan. And such a worker said Felix. Uncle Roger said he never had a boy he could depend on like Peter, I said. It's too late to be saying all these nice things about him now, said the story girl. He won't ever know how much we thought of him. It's too late. If he gets better, I'll tell him, said Cecily resolutely. I wish I hadn't boxed his ears that day he tried to kiss me, went on Felicity who was evidently raking her conscience for past offenses in regard to Peter. Of course, I couldn't be expected to let a high, to let a boy kiss me, but I needn't have been so cross about it. I might have been more dignified. And I told him I just hated him. That wasn't true, but I suppose he'll die thinking it is. Oh, dear me, what makes people say things they've got to be so sorry for afterwards? I suppose if Peter d d dies, he'll go to heaven anyhow, sobbed Cecily. He's been real good all this summer, but he isn't a church member. He's a Presbyterian, you know, said Felicity reassuringly. Her tone expressed her conviction that that would carry Peter through if anything would. We're none of us church members, but of course Peter couldn't be sent to the bad place. That would be ridiculous. What would they do with him there, when he's so good and polite and honest and kind? Oh, I'll think he'll be all right, too, sighed Cecily. But you know, he never did go to church and Sunday school before the summer. Well, his father ran away, and his mother was too busy earning a living to bring him up right, argued Felicity. Don't you suppose that anybody, even God, would make allowances for that? Of course Peter will go to heaven, said the story girl. He's not grown up enough to go anywhere else. Children always go to heaven. But I don't want him to go there or anywhere else. I want him to stay right here. I know heaven must be a splendid place, but I'm sure Peter would rather be here, having fun with us. Sarah Stanley, rebuked Felicity. I should think you wouldn't say such things at such a solemn time. You're such a queer girl. Wouldn't you rather be here yourself than in heaven? 
said the Story Girl bluntly. Wouldn't you now, Felicity King? Tell the truth, cross your heart. <laughs> but Felicity took refuge from this inconvenient question in tears. If we could only do something to help Peter, I said desperately. It seems dreadful not to be able to do a single thing. There's one thing we can do, said Cecily gently. We can pray for him. So we can, I agreed. I'm going to pray like 60, said Felix energetically. We'll have to be awful good, you know, warned Cecily. There's no use praying if you're not good. That will be easy, sighed Felicity. I don't feel a bit like being bad. If anything happens to Peter, I feel sure I'll never be naughty again. I won't have the heart. We did indeed pray most sincerely for Peter's recovery. We did not, as in the case of Patty, tack it on after more important things, but put it in the very forefront of our petitions. Even skeptical Dan prayed, his skepticism falling away from him like a discarded garment in this valley of the shadow, which sifts out hearts and tries souls, until we all, grown up or children, realize our weakness. And, finding that our own puny strength is a reed shaken in the wind, creep back humbly to the God we vainly dreamed we could do without. Peter was no better the next day. Aunt Olivia reported that his mother was broken-hearted. We did not again ask to be released from work. Instead, we went at it with feverish zeal. If we worked hard, there was less time for grief and grievous thoughts. We picked apples and dragged them to the granary doggedly. In the afternoon, Aunt Janet brought us a lunch of apple turnovers. But we could not eat them. Peter, as Felicity reminded us with a burst of tears, had been so fond of apple turnovers. And oh, how good we were. How angelically and unnaturally good. Never was there a band of kind, sweet-tempered, unselfish children in any orchard. Even Felicity and Dan, for once in their lives, got through the day without any exchange of left-handed compliments. Cecily confided to me that she never meant to put her hair up in curlers on Saturday nights again because it was pretending. She was so anxious to repent of something, sweet girl, and this was all she could think of. During the afternoon, Judy Pinot brought up a tear-blooded note from Sarah Ray. Sarah had not been allowed to visit the hill farm since Peter had developed measles. She was an unhappy little exile and could only relieve her anguish of soul by daily letters to Cecily, which the faithful and obliging Judy Pinot brought up for her. These epistles were as gushingly underlined as if Sarah had been a correspondent of early Victorian days. Cecily did not write back, because Mrs. Ray had decreed that no letters must be taken down from the hill farm lest they carry infection. Cecily had offered to bake every epistle thoroughly in the oven before sending it. But Mrs. Ray was inexorable, and Cecily had to content herself by sending long verbal messages with Judy Pinot. My own dearest Cecily ran Sarah's letter. I have just heard the sad news about poor, dear Peter. I can't describe my feelings. They are dreadful. I have been crying all the afternoon. I wish I could fly to you, but Ma will not let me. She is afraid I will catch the measles, but I would rather have the measles a dozen times over than be separated from you all like this but I have felt ever since the Judgment Sunday that I must obey Ma better than I used to. If anything happens to Peter and you are let see him before it happens, give him my love and tell him how sorry I am and that I hope we will all meet in a better world. Everything in school is about the same. The master is awful cross by spells. Jimmy Fruin walked home with Nellie Bowen last night from prayer meeting and her only 14. Don't you think it horrid beginning so young? You and me would never do anything like that till we were grown up, would we? Willie Fraser looks so lonesome in school these days. I must stop, for Ma says I waste far too much time writing letters. Tell Judy all the news for me. Your own true friend, Sarah Ray. 
P.S. Oh, I do hope Peter will get better. Ma is going to get me a new brown dress for the winter. S.R. When evening came, we went to our seats under the whispering, sighing fir trees. It was a beautiful night, clear, windless, frosty. Someone galloped down the road on horseback, lustily singing a comic song. How dared he! We felt that it was an insult to our wretchedness. If Peter were going to... going to... Well, if anything happened to Peter, we felt so miserably sure that the music of life would be stilled for us, forever. How could anyone in the world be happy when we were so unhappy? Presently, Aunt Olivia came down the long twilight arcade. Her bright hair was uncovered, and she looked slim and queen-like in her light dress. We thought Aunt Olivia very pretty then. But looking back from a mature standpoint, I realize that she must have been an unusually beautiful woman. And she looked her prettiest as she stood under the swaying boughs in the last faint light of the autumn dusk and smiled down on our woe-begone faces. Dear, sorrowful little people, I bring you glad tidings of great joy, she said. The doctor has just been here, and he finds Peter much better, and thinks he will pull through after all. We gazed up at her in silence for a few moments. When we had heard the news of Patty's recovery, we had been noisy and jubilant. But we were very quiet now. We had been too near something dark and terrible and menacing, and though it was thus suddenly removed, the chill and shadow of it were about us still. Presently, the story girl, who had been standing up, leaning against a tall fir, slipped down to the ground in a huddled fashion and broke into a very passion of weeping. <laughs> I had never heard anyone cry so, with dreadful, rending sobs. I was used to hearing girls cry. It was as much Sarah Ray's normal state as any other. And even Felicity and Cecily availed themselves occasionally of the privilege of sex. But I had never heard any girl cry like this. It gave me the same unpleasant sensation which I felt one time when I had seen my father cry. Oh, don't, Sarah, don't. I said gently, patting her convulsed shoulder. You are a queer girl, said Felicity, more tolerantly than usual, however. You never cried a speck when you thought Peter was going to die, and now when he is going to get better, you cry like that. Sarah, child, come with me, said Aunt Olivia, bending over her. The story girl got up and went away with Aunt Olivia's arms around her. The sound of her crying died away under the firs, and with it seemed to go the dread and grief that had been our portion for hours. In the reaction, our spirits rose with a bound. Oh, ain't it great that Peter's going to be all right? said Dan, springing up. I never was so glad of anything in my whole life, declared Felicity in shameless rapture. Can't we send word somehow to Sarah Ray tonight? asked Cecily, the ever-thoughtful. She's feeling so bad, and she'll have to feel that way till tomorrow if we can't. Let's all go down to the Ray Gate and holler to Judy Pinnell till she comes out, suggested Felix. Accordingly, we went and hollered with a right good will. We were much taken aback to find that Mrs. Ray came to the gate instead of Judy, and rather sourly demanded what we were yelling about. When she heard the news, however... She had the decency to say she was glad, and to promise she would convey the good tidings to Sarah, who is already in bed, where all the children of her age should be, added Mrs. Ray severely. We had no intention of going to bed for a good two hours yet. Instead, after devoutly thanking goodness that our grown-ups, in spite of some imperfections, were not of the Mrs. Ray type, we betook ourselves to the granary lighted a huge lantern which Dan had made out of a turnip, and proceeded to devour all the apples we might have eaten through the day but had not. We were a blithe little crew, sitting there in the light of our goblin lantern. 
We had in very truth been given beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning. Life was a red rose once more. I'm going to make a big batch of patty pans first thing in the morning, said Felicity jubilantly. Isn't it queer? Last night I felt just like praying, and tonight I feel just like cooking. We mustn't forget to thank God for making Peter better, said Cecily as we finally went to the house. Do you suppose Peter wouldn't have gotten better anyway? said Dan. Oh, Dan, what makes you ask such questions? exclaimed Cecily in real distress. I don't know, said Dan. They just kind of come into my head, like... But of course I mean to thank God when I say my prayers tonight. That's only decent. End of chapter 29「Thirty of the Story Girl」by L. M. Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30 A Compound Letter. Once Peter was out of danger, he recovered rapidly, but he found his convalescence rather tedious. And Aunt Olivia suggested to us one day that we write a compound letter to amuse him until he could come to the window and talk to us from a safe distance. The idea appealed to us, and, the day being Saturday and the apples all picked, we betook ourselves to the orchard to compose our epistles, Cecily having first sent word by a convenient caller to Sarah Ray that she too might have a letter ready. Later, I, having at that time a mania for preserving all documents relating to our life in Carlisle, copied those letters in the blank pages at the back of my dream book. Hence, I can reproduce them verbatim, with the bouquet they have retained through all the long years since they were penned in that autumn orchard on the hill, with its fading leaves and frosted grasses, and the mild, delightsome melancholy of the late October day enfolding. Cecily's Letter Dear Peter, I am so very glad and thankful that you are going to get better. We were so afraid you wouldn't last Tuesday. And we felt dreadful, even Felicity. We all prayed for you. I think the others have stopped now, but I keep it up every night. Still, for fear you might have a relapse. I don't know if that's spelled right. I haven't the dictionary handy. And if I ask the others, Felicity will laugh at me, though she cannot spell lots of words herself. I'm saving some of the Honorable Mr. Wallen's pears for you. I've got them hid where nobody can find them. There's only a dozen because Dan ate all the rest. But I guess you will like them. We have got all the apples picked and are all ready to take the measles now, if we have to. But I hope we won't. If we have to, though, I'd rather catch them from you than from anyone else. Because we are acquainted with you. If I do take the measles, and anything happens to me, Felicity is to have my cherry vase. I'd rather give it to the story girl, but Dan says it ought to be kept in the family, even if Felicity is a crank. I haven't anything else valuable, since I gave Sarah Ray my forget-me-not jug, but if you would like anything I've got, let me know and I'll leave instructions for you to have it. The story girl has told us some splendid stories lately. I wish I was clever like her. Ma says it doesn't matter if you are not clever as long as you're good, but I'm not even very good. I think this is all my news, except that I want to tell you how much we all think of you, Peter. When we heard you were sick, we all said nice things about you, but we were afraid that it was too late, and I said if you got better, I'd tell you. It is easier to write it than to tell it out to your face. We think you are smart and polite and obliging, and a great worker and a gentleman. Your true friend, Cecily King. P.S. If you answer my letter, don't say anything about the pears, because I don't want Dan to find out there's any left. C.K. Felicity's Letter Dear Peter, Aunt Olivia says for us all to write a compound letter to cheer you up. We are all awful glad you are getting better. It gave us an awful scare when we heard you were going to die, but you will soon be all right and able to get out again, 
be careful you don't catch cold. I am going to bake some nice things for you and send them over, now that the doctor says you can eat them, and I'll send you my rosebud plate to eat off of. I'm only lending it, you know, not giving it. I let very few people use it because it is my greatest treasure. Mind you don't break it. Aunt Olivia must always wash it, not your mother. I do hope the rest of us won't catch the measles. It must look horrid to have red spots all over your face. We all feel pretty well yet. The story girl says as many queer things as ever. Felix thinks he is getting thin, but he is fatter than ever, and no wonder with all the apples he eats. He has given up trying to eat the bitter apples at last. Beverly has grown half an inch since July, by the mark on the hall door, and he is awful pleased about it. I told him I guessed the magic seed was taking effect at last, and he got mad. He never gets mad at anything the story girl says, and yet she is so sarcastic by times. Dan is pretty hard to get along with as usual, but I try to bear patiently with him. Cicely is well and says she isn't going to curl her hair anymore. She is so conscientious. I am glad my hair curls of itself, ain't you? We haven't seen Sarah Ray since you got sick. She is awful lonesome, and Judy says she cries nearly all the time, but that is nothing new. I'm awful sorry for Sarah, but I'm glad I'm not her. She is going to write you a letter, too. You'll let me see what she puts in it, won't you? You'd better take some Mexican tea now. It's a great blood purifier. I am going to get a lovely dark blue dress for the winter. It is ever so much prettier than Sarah Ray's brown one. Sarah Ray's mother has no taste. The story girl's father is sending her a new red dress and a red velvet cap from Paris. She is so fond of red. I can't bear it. It looks so common. Mother says I can get a velvet hood, too. Cicely says she doesn't believe it's right to wear velvet when it's so expensive and the heathen are crying for the gospel. She got that idea from a Sunday school paper, but I am going to get my hood all the same. Well, Peter, I have no more news, so I will close for this time. Hoping you will soon be quite well, I remain. Yours sincerely, Felicity King. P.S. The story girl peeked over my shoulder and says I ought to have signed it yours affectionately, but I know better, because the family guide has told lots of times how you should sign yourself when you are writing to a young man who is only a friend. F.K. Felix's Letter Dear Peter, I am awful glad you are getting better. We all felt bad when we thought you wouldn't, but I felt worse than the others because we hadn't been on very good terms lately, and I had said mean things about you. I am sorry, and, Peter, you can pray for anything you like and I won't ever object again. I'm glad Uncle Alec interfered and stopped the fight. If I had licked you and you had died of the measles, it would have been a dreadful thing. We all have all the apples in and haven't had much to do just now, and we are having lots of fun, but we wish you are here to join in. I am a lot thinner than I was. I guess working so hard picking apples is a good thing to make you thin. The girls are all well. Felicity puts on as many airs as ever, but she makes great things to eat. I have had some splendid dreams since we have gave up writing them down. That is always the way. We ain't going to school till we're sure we are not going to have the measles. This is all I can think of, so I will draw to a close. Remember, you can pray for anything you like. Felix King Sarah Ray's Letter Dear Peter, I never wrote to a boy before, so please excuse all mistakes. I am so glad you are getting better. We were so afraid you were going to die. I cried all night about it. But now that you are out of danger, will you tell me what it really feels like to think you are going to die? Does it feel queer? Were you very badly frightened? Ma won't let me go up the hill at all now. I would die if it were not for Judy Pinot. The French names are so hard to spell. 
Judy is very obliging, and I feel that she sympathizes with me. In my lonely hours, I read my dream book and Cecily's old letters, and they are such a comfort to me. I have been reading one of the school library books, too. It is pretty good, but I wish they had got more love stories, because they are so exciting. But the master would not let them. If you had died, Peter, and your father had heard, wouldn't he have felt dreadful? We are having beautiful weather, and the scenery is fine since the leaves turned. I think there is nothing so pretty as nature after all. I hope all danger from the measles will soon be over, and we can all meet again at the home on the hill. Till then, farewell. Your true friend, Sarah Ray. P.S. Don't let Felicity see this letter. S.R. Dan's letter. Dear old Pete, awful glad you cheated the doctor. I thought you weren't the kind to turn up your toes so easy. <laughs> you should have heard the girls crying. They're all getting their winter finery now, and the talk about it would make you sick. The story girl is getting hers from Paris, and Felicity is awful jealous, though she pretends she isn't. I can see through her. Kit Marr was up here Thursday to see the girls. She's had the measles, so she isn't scared. She's a great girl to laugh. I like a girl that laughs, don't you? We had a call from Peg Bowen yesterday. You should have seen the store girl hustling Pat out of the way. For all she says, she don't believe he was bewitched. Peg had your rheumatism ring on, and the store girl's blue beads and Sarah Ray's lace sewed across the front of her dress. She wanted some tobacco and some pickles. Ma gave her some pickles, but said we wouldn't have no tobacco. And Peg went off mad, but I guess she wouldn't bewitch anything on account of the pickles. I ain't any hand to write letters, so I guess I'll stop. Hope you'll be out soon. Dan. The Story Girl's Letter Dear Peter, Oh, how glad I am that you are getting better. Those days when we thought you wouldn't were the hardest of my whole life. It seemed too dreadful to be true that perhaps you would die. And then, when we heard you were going to get better, that seemed too good to be true. Oh, Peter, hurry up and get well, for we are having such good times and we miss you so much. I have coaxed Uncle Alec not to burn his potato stalks till you are well, because I remember how you always like to see the potato stalks burn. Uncle Alec consented, though Aunt Janet said it was high time they were burned. Uncle Roger burned his last night, and it was such fun. Pat is splendid. He has never had a sick spell since that bad one. I would send him over to be company for you, but Aunt Janet says no, because he might carry the measles back. I don't see how he could, but we must obey Aunt Janet. She is very good to us all, but I know she does not approve of me. She says I am my father's own child. I know that doesn't mean anything complimentary, because she looked so queer when she saw that I had heard her, but I don't care. I'm glad I'm like father. I had a splendid letter from him this week, with the darlingest pictures in it. He is painting a new picture which is going to make him famous. I wonder what Aunt Janet will say then. Do you know, Peter, yesterday I thought I saw the family ghost at last. I was coming through the gap in the hedge, and I saw somebody in blue standing under Uncle Alec's tree. How my heart beat! My hair should have stood up on end with terror, but it didn't. I felt to see, and it was lying down quite flat. But it was only a visitor after all. I don't know whether I was glad or disappointed. I don't think it would have been a pleasant experience to see the ghost, but after I had seen it, think what a heroine I would be. Oh, Peter, what do you think? I have got acquainted with the awkward man at last. I never thought it would be so easy. Yesterday, Aunt Olivia wanted some ferns, so I went back to the maple woods to get them for her, and I found some lovely ones by the spring. And while I was sitting there, looking into the spring, who should come along but the awkward man himself? He sat right down beside me and began to talk. I never was so surprised in my life. We had a very interesting talk, and I told him two of my best stories, and a great many of my secrets into the bargain. They may say what they like, but he was not one bit shy or awkward, and he has beautiful eyes. He did not tell me any of his secrets, but I believe he will some day. Of course, I never said a word about his Alice room, but I gave him a hint about his little brown book. I said I loved poetry and often felt like writing it, and then I said, Do you ever feel like that, Mr. Dale? He said yes, sometimes he felt that way, 
but he did not mention the brown book. I thought he might have. But after all, I don't like people who tell you everything the first time you meet them, like Sarah Ray. When he went away, he said, I hope I shall have the pleasure of meeting you again, just as seriously and politely as if I was a grown-up young lady. I am sure he could never have said it if I had been really grown up. I told him it was likely he would, and that he wasn't to mind if I had a longer skirt on next time, because I'd be just the same person. I told the children a beautiful new fairy story today. I made them go to the spruce wood to hear it. A spruce wood is the proper place to tell fairy stories in. Felicity says she can't see that it makes any difference where you tell them, but oh, it does. I wish you had been there to hear it too, but when you are well, I will tell it over again for you. I am going to call the southern wood apple ringing after this. Beverly says that is what they call it in Scotland, and I think it sounds so much more poetical than southern wood. Felicity says the right name is boys love, but I think that sounds silly. Oh, Peter, shadows are such pretty things. The orchard is full of them this very minute. Sometimes they are so still you would think them asleep. Then they go laughing and skipping. Outside in the oat field, they are always chasing each other. They are the wild shadows. The shadows in the orchard are the tame shadows. Everything seems to be rather tired growing except the spruces and chrysanthemums in Aunt Olivia's garden. The sunshine is so thick and yellow and lazy, and the crickets sing all day long. The birds are nearly all gone, and most of the maple leaves have fallen. Just to make you laugh, I'll write you a little story I heard Uncle Alec telling last night. It was about Elder Fruin's grandfather taking a pair of rope reins to lead a piano home. Everybody laughed except Aunt Janet. Old Mr. Fruin was her grandfather, too, and she wouldn't laugh. One day, when old Mr. Fruin was a young man of eighteen, his father came home and said, Sandy, I bought a piano at Simon Ward's sale today. You're to go tomorrow and bring it home. So next day, Sandy started off on horseback with a pair of rope reins to lead the piano home. He thought it was some kind of livestock. And then, Uncle Roger told about old Mark Ward, who got up to make a speech at a church missionary social when he was drunk. Of course, he didn't get drunk at the social. He went there that way. And this was his speech. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, I can't express my thoughts on this grand subject of missions. It's in this poor human critter, patting himself on the breast. But he can't get it out. I'll tell you these stories when you get well. I can tell them ever so much better than I can write them. I know Felicity is wondering why I'm writing such a long letter, so perhaps I'd better stop. If your mother reads it to you, there's a good deal of it she may not understand, but I think your Aunt Jane would. I remain your very affectionate friend, Sarah Stanley. I did not keep a copy of my own letter, and I've forgotten everything that was in it, except the first sentence, in which I told Peter I was awful glad he was getting better. Peter's delight on receiving our letters knew no bounds. He insisted on answering them, and his letter, painstakingly disinfected, was duly delivered to us. Aunt Olivia had written it, at his dictation, which was a gain, as far as spelling and punctuation went, but Peter's individuality seemed merged and lost in Aunt Olivia's big, dashing script. Not until the story girl read the letter to us in the granary by jack-o'-lantern light, in the mimicry of Peter's very voice, did we savor the real bouquet of it. Peter's Letter Dear everybody, but especially Felicity, I was awful glad to get your letters. It makes you real important to be sick, but the time seems awful long when you're getting better. Your letters were all great, but I liked Felicity's best, and next to hers, the story girls. Felicity, it will be awful good of you to send me things to eat and the rosebud plate. I'll be awful careful of it. I hope you won't catch the measles, for they are not nice, especially when they strike in. But you would look all right, even if you did have red spots on your face. I would like to try the Mexican tea, because you want me to, but Mother says no, she doesn't believe in it, and Burton's bitters are a great deal healthier. If I was you, I would get the velvet hood all right. The heathen live in warm countries, so they don't want hoods. I'm glad you are still praying for me, Cecily, for you can't trust the measles. And I'm glad you're keeping you-know-what for me. I don't believe anything will happen to you if you do take the measles. But if anything does, I'd like that little red book of yours, The Safe Compass, just to remember you by. It's such a good book to read on Sundays. It is interesting and religious too. So is the Bible. I hadn't quite finished the Bible before I took the measles, but Mara's reading the last chapters to me. 
There's an awful lot in that book. I can't understand the whole of it since I'm only a hired boy, but some parts are real easy. I'm awful glad you have such a good opinion of me. I don't deserve it, but after this I'll try to. I can't tell you how I feel about all your kindness. I'm like the fellow the story girl wrote about who couldn't get it out. I have the picture the story girl gave me for my sermon on the wall at the foot of my bed. I like to look at it, it looks so much like Aunt Jane. Felix, I've given up praying that I'd be the only one to eat the bitter apples, and I'll never pray for anything like that again. It was a horrid, mean prayer. I didn't know it then, but after the measles struck in I found out it was. Aunt Jane wouldn't have liked it. After this I'm going to pray prayers I needn't be ashamed of. Sarah Ray, I don't know what it feels like to be going to die because I didn't know I was going to die till I got better. Mother says I was loony most of the time after they struck in. It was just because they struck in I was loony. I ain't loony naturally, Felicity. I will do what you asked in your proscript, Sarah, although it will be hard. I'm glad Peg Bowen didn't catch you, Dan. Maybe she bewitched me that night we were at her place, and that is why the measles struck in. I'm awful glad Mr. King is going to leave the potato stalks until I get well, and I'm obliged to the story girl for coaxing him. I guess she will find out about Alice yet. There were some parts of her letter I couldn't see through, but when the measles strike in, they leave you stupid for a spell. Anyhow, it was a fine letter, and they were all fine, and I'm awful glad I have so many nice friends, even if I am only a hired boy. Perhaps I'd never have found it out if the measles hadn't struck in. So I'm glad they did, but I hope they never will again. Your obedient servant, Peter Craig. End of chapter 30「Chapter thirty one of the Story Girl by L. M. Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty one On the Edge of Light and Dark. We celebrated the November day when Peter was permitted to rejoin us by a picnic in the orchard. Sarah Ray was also allowed to come under protest, and her joy over being among us once more was almost pathetic. She and Cecily cried in one another's arms. <laughs> as if they had been parted for years. <laughs> we had a beautiful day for our picnic. November dreamed that it was May. The air was soft and mellow, with pale aerial mists in the valleys and over the leafless beaches on the western hill. The sear stubble fields brooded in glamour, and the sky was pearly blue. The leaves were still thick on the apple trees, though they were russet-hued, and the aftergrowth of grass was richly green, unharmed as yet by the nipping frosts of previous nights. The wind made a sweet, drowsy murmur in the boughs, as of bees among apple blossoms. It's just like spring, isn't it? asked Felicity. The story girl shook her head. No, not quite. It looks like spring, but it isn't spring. It's as if everything was resting, getting ready to sleep. In spring they're getting ready to grow. Can't you feel the difference? I think it's just like spring, insisted Felicity. In the sun-sweet place before the pulpit stone, we boys had put up a board table. Aunt Janet allowed us to cover it with an old tablecloth, the warm places in which the girls artfully concealed with frost-whitened ferns. We had the kitchen dishes, and the table was gaily decorated with Cecily's three scarlet geraniums and maple leaves in the cherry vase. As for the viands, they were fit for the gods on high Olympus. Felicity had spent the whole previous day and the forenoon of the picnic day in concocting them. Her crowning achievement was a rich little plum cake on the white frosting of which the words welcome back were lettered in pink candies. This was put before Peter's place and almost overcame him. To think that you go to so much trouble for me he said with a glance of adoring gratitude at Felicity. Felicity got all the gratitude, although the story girl had originated the idea and seeded the raisins and beaten the eggs, while Cecily had trudged all the way to Mrs. Jameson's little shop below the church to buy of the pink candies. But that is the way of the world. We ought to have grace, said Felicity, as we sat down at the festal board. Will anyone say it? She looked at me, but I blushed to the roots of my hair and shook my head sheepishly. An awkward pause ensued. It looked as if we would have to proceed without grace, 
when Felix suddenly shut his eyes, bent his head, and said a very good grace without any appearance of embarrassment. We looked at him when it was over with an increase of respect. Where on earth did you learn that, Felix? I asked. It's the grace Uncle Alex says at every meal, answered Felix. <laughs> we felt rather ashamed of ourselves. Was it possible that we had paid so little attention to Uncle Alec's grace that we did not recognize it when we heard it on other lips? Now, said Felicity jubilantly, let's eat everything up. In truth, it was a merry little feast. We had gone without our dinners in order to save our appetites, and we did ample justice to Felicity's good things. Patty sat on the pulpit stone and watched us with great yellow eyes, knowing that tidbits would come his way later on. Many witty things were said, or at least we thought them witty, <laughs> and uproarious was the laughter. <laughs> <laughs> Never had the old King Orchard known blither merrymaking <laughs> or lighter hearts. <laughs> <laughs> the picnic over, we played games until the early falling dusk, and then we went with Uncle Alec to the back field to burn the potato stalks, the crowning delight of the day. The stalks were in heaps all over the field, and we were allowed the privilege of setting fire to them. Twas glorious. In a few minutes, the field was alight with blazing bonfires, over which rolled great pungent clouds of smoke. From pile to pile we ran, shrieking with delight. <laughs> to poke each up with a long stick ah. and watch the gush of rose-red sparks stream off into the night. Oh! Ah. And what a whirl of smoke and firelight and wild, fantastic, hurtling shadows we were. <laughs> 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 when we grew tired of our sport, we went to the windward side of the field and perched ourselves on the high pole fence that skirted a dark spruce wood full of strange furtive sounds. Over us was a great dark sky blossoming with silver stars, and all around lay dusky, mysterious reaches of meadow and wood in the soft, empurpled night. Away to the east, a shimmering silveriness beneath the palace of aerial cloud foretokened moonrise. But directly before us, the potato field, with its wreathing smoke and sullen flames. The gigantic shadow of Uncle Alec crossing and recrossing it, reminding us of Peter's famous description of the bad place, and probably suggested the story girl's remark. I know a story, she said, infusing just the right shade of weirdness into her voice. About a man who saw the devil. Now, what's the matter, Felicity? I can never get used to the way you mentioned the, the, that name, complained Felicity. To hear you speak of the old scratch, anyone would think he was just a common person. Never mind. Tell us the story, I said curiously. It is about Mrs. John Martin's uncle at Markdale, said the story girl. I heard Uncle Roger telling it the other night. He didn't know I was sitting on the cellar hatch outside the window, or I don't suppose he would have told it. Mrs. Martin's uncle's name was William Cowan. And he has been dead for twenty years, but sixty years ago he was a young man, and a very wild, wicked young man. He did everything bad he could think of, and never went to church, and he laughed at everything religious, even the devil. He didn't believe there was a devil at all. One beautiful summer Sunday evening, his mother pleaded with him to go to church with her, but he would not. He told her that he was going fishing instead, and when church time came, he swaggered past the church, with his fishing rod over his shoulder, singing a godless song. Halfway between the church and the harbor, there was a thick spruce wood, and the path ran through it. When William Cowan was halfway through it, something came out of the wood and walked beside him. I had never heard anything more horribly suggestive than that innocent word, Something, as enunciated by the story girl. I felt Cecily's hand, icy cold, clutching mine. What, what was it like? Whispered Felix, curiosity getting the better of his terror. It was tall, black and hairy, said the story girl, her eyes glowing with uncanny intensity in the red glare of the fires. 
and it lifted one great hairy hand, with claws on the end of it, and clapped William Cowan, first on one shoulder and then on the other, and said, "'Good sport to you, brother.' William Cowan gave a horrible scream and fell on his face right there in the wood. Some of the men around the church door heard the scream, and they rushed down to the wood. They saw nothing but William Cowan lying like a dead man on the path. They took him up and carried him home, and when they undressed him to put him to bed, there on each shoulder was the mark of a big hand, burned into the flesh. It was weeks before the burns healed, and the scars never went away. Always, as long as William Cowan lived, he carried on his shoulders the prince of the devil's hand. I really do not know how we should ever have got home had we been left to our own devices. We were cold with fright. How could we turn our backs on the eerie spruce wood out of which something might pop at any moment? How cross those long, shadowy fields between us and our roof tree! How venture through the darkly mysterious bracken hollow? <sighs> Fortunately, Uncle Alec came along at this crisis and said he thought we'd better come home now since the fires were nearly out. We slid down from the fence and started, taking care to keep close together and in front of Uncle Alec. I don't believe a word of that yarn, <laughs> said Dan trying to speak with his usual incredulity. I don't see how you can help believing it, said Cecily. It isn't as if it was something we'd read of, or that happened far away. It happened just down in Markdale, and I've seen that very spruce wood myself. Oh, I suppose William Cowan got a fright of some kind, conceded Dan. But I don't believe he saw the devil. Old Mr. Morrison at Lower Markdale was one of the men who undressed him, and he remembers seeing the marks, said the story girl triumphantly. How did William Cowan behave afterwards? I asked. He was a changed man, said the story girl solemnly. Too much changed. He was never known to laugh again or even smile. He became a very religious man, which was a good thing, but he was dreadfully gloomy and thought everything pleasant sinful. He wouldn't even eat any more than was actually necessary to keep him alive. Uncle Roger says that if he had been a Roman Catholic, he would have become a monk. But, as he was a Presbyterian, all he could do was turn into a crank. Yes, but your Uncle Roger was never clapped on the shoulder and called brother by the devil, said Peter. If he had, he mightn't have been so precious jolly afterwards himself. I do wish to goodness, said Felicity in exasperation, that you'd stop talking of the... the... Of such subjects in the dark, I'm so scared now that I keep thinking father's steps behind us are somethings. Just think, my own father. The story girl slipped her arm through Felicity's. Never mind, she said soothingly. I'll tell you another story. Such a beautiful story that you'll forget all about the devil. She told us one of Hans Andersen's most exquisite tales and the magic of her voice charmed away all our fear, so that when we reached the Bracken Hollow, a lake of shadow surrounded by the silver shore of moonlit fields, we all went through it without a thought of his satanic majesty at all, and beyond us on the hill, the home light was glowing from the farmhouse window like a beacon of old loves. End of chapter 31 Chapter 32 of The Story Girl by L. M. Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 32 The Opening of the Blue Chest. November wakened from her dream of May in a bad temper. The day after the picnic, a cold autumn rain set in, and we got up to find our world a drenched, wind riven place with sodden fields and dour skies. The rain was weeping on the roof as if it were shedding the tears of old sorrows. The willow by the gate tossed its gaunt branches wildly, as if it were some passionate spectral thing, wringing its fleshless hands in agony. The orchard was haggard and uncomely. Nothing seemed the same except the staunch, trusty old spruces. It was Friday, but we were not to begin going to school again until Monday, 
so we spent the day in the granary, sorting apples and hearing tales. In the evening the rain ceased, the wind came around to the northwest, freezing suddenly, and a chilly yellow sunset beyond the dark hills seemed to herald a brighter morrow. Felicity and the story girl and I walked down to the post office for the mail, along a road where fallen leaves were eddying fitfully up and down before us in weird, uncanny dances of their own. The evening was full of eerie sounds, the cracking of fir boughs, the whistle of the wind in the treetops, the vibrations of strips of dried bark on the rail fences. But we carried summer and sunshine in our hearts, and the bleak unloveliness of the outer world only intensified our inner radiance. Felicity wore her new velvet hood, with a coquettish little collar of white fur about her neck. Her golden curls framed her lovely face, and the wind stung the pink of her cheeks to crimson. On my left hand walked the story girl, her red cap on her jaunty brown head. She scattered her words along the path like the pearls and diamonds of the old fairy tale. I remember that I strutted along quite insufferably, for we met several of the Carlisle boys, and I felt that I was an exceptionally lucky fellow to have such beauty on one side and such charm on the other. There was one of Father's thin letters for Felix, a fat foreign letter for the story girl addressed in her father's minute handwriting, a drop letter for Cecily from some school friend with in haste written across the corner, and a letter for Aunt Janet, postmarked Montreal. I can't think who this is from, said Felicity. Nobody in Montreal ever writes to Mother. Cicely's letter is from M. Frewen. She always puts in haste on her letters, no matter what is in them. When we reached home, Aunt Janet opened and read her Montreal letter. Then she laid it down and looked about her in astonishment. Well, did ever any mortal, she said. What in the world is the matter? said Uncle Alec. This letter is from James Ward's wife in Montreal, said Aunt Janet solemnly. Rachel Ward is dead, and she told James's wife to write to me and tell me to open the old blue chest. Hurrah! shouted Dan. Donald King, said his mother severely. Rachel Ward was your relation, and she is dead. What do you mean by such behavior? I never was acquainted with her, said Dan sulkily. And I wasn't hurrahing because she is dead. I hurrahed because that blue chest is to be opened at last. So poor Rachel is gone, said Uncle Alec. She must have been an old woman. Seventy-five, I suppose. I remember her as a fine, blooming young woman. Well, well. And so the old chest is to be opened at last. What is to be done with its contents? Rachel left instructions about them, answered Aunt Janet, referring to the letter. The wedding dress and veil and letters are to be burned. There are two jugs in it which are to be sent to James's wife. The rest of the things are to be given around among the connection. Each member's is to have one, to remember her by. Oh, can't we open it right away this very night? said Felicity eagerly. No, indeed. Aunt Janet folded up the letter decidedly. That chest has been locked up for fifty years, and it'll stand being locked up one more night. You children wouldn't sleep a wink tonight if we opened it now. You'd go wild with excitement. I'm sure I won't sleep anyhow, said Felicity. Well, at least you'll open it first thing in the morning, won't you, Ma? No, I'll do nothing of the sort, was Aunt Janet's pitiless decree. I want to get the work out of the way first, and Roger and Olivia will want to be here, too. We'll say ten o'clock tomorrow forenoon. That's sixteen whole hours yet, sighed Felicity. I'm going right over to tell the story girl, said Cecily. Won't you be excited? We were all excited. 
We spent the evening speculating on the possible contents of the chest, and Cecily dreamed miserably that night that the moths had eaten everything in it. The morning dawned on a beautiful world. A very slight fall of snow had come in the night, just enough to look like a filmy veil of lace flung over the dark evergreens and the hard frozen ground. A new blossom time seemed to have revisited the orchard. The spruce wood behind the house appeared to be woven out of enchantment. There is nothing more beautiful than a thickly growing wood of firs, lightly powdered with new fallen snow. As the sun remained hidden by the gray clouds, this fairy beauty lasted all day. The story girl came over early in the morning, and Sarah Ray, to whom faithful Cecily had sent word, was also on hand. Felicity did not approve of this. Sarah Ray isn't any relation to our family, she scolded to Cecily, and she has no right to be present. She's a particular friend of mine, said Cecily with dignity. We have her in everything, and it would hurt her feelings dreadfully to be left out of this. Peter isn't a relation either, but he's going to be here when we open it, so why shouldn't Sarah? Peter ain't a member of the family yet. Maybe he will be someday. Hey, Felicity, said Dan. You're awful smart, aren't you, Dan King? said Felicity, reddening. Perhaps you'd like to send for Kitty Marr, too though she does laugh at your big mouth. Oh, it seems as if ten o'clock would never come, sighed the story girl. The work is all done, and Aunt Olivia and Uncle Roger are here, and the chest might just as well be opened right away. Mother said ten o'clock, and she'll stick to it, said Felicity crossly. It's only nine now. Let us put the clock on half an hour, said the story girl. The clock in the hall isn't going, so no one will know the difference. We all looked at each other. I wouldn't dare, said Felicity irresolutely. Oh, if that's all, I'll do it, said the story girl. When ten o'clock struck, Aunt Janet came into the kitchen remarking innocently that it hadn't seemed any time since nine. We must have looked horribly guilty but none of the grown-ups suspected anything. Uncle Alec brought in the axe and pried off the cover of the old blue chest, while everybody stood around in silence. Then came the unpacking. It was certainly an interesting performance. Aunt Janet and Aunt Olivia took everything out and laid it on the kitchen table. We children were forbidden to touch anything, but fortunately we were not forbidden to use our eyes and tongues. There are the pink and gold vases Grandmother King gave her, said Felicity, as Aunt Olivia unwrapped from their tissue paper swathings a pair of slender, old-fashioned, twisted vases of pink glass over which little gold leaves were scattered. Aren't they handsome? And oh! exclaimed Cecily in delight. There's the china fruit basket with the apple on the handle. Doesn't it look real? I've thought so much about it. Oh, Mother, please let me hold it for a minute. I'll be as careful as careful. There comes the china set Grandfather King gave her, said the story girl wistfully. Oh, it makes me feel sad. Think of all the hopes that Rachel Ward must have put away in this chest with all her pretty things. Following these came a quaint little candlestick of blue china and the two jugs which were to be sent to James' wife. They are handsome, said Aunt Janet rather enviously. They must be a hundred years old. Aunt Sarah Ward gave them to Rachel, and she had them for at least fifty years. I should have thought one would have been enough for James's wife. But of course, we must do just as Rachel wished. I declare, here's a dozen tin patty pans. Tin patty pans aren't very romantic, said the story girl discontentedly. I notice that you are as fond as anyone of what is baked in them, said Aunt Janet. I've heard of those patty pans. An old servant Grandmother King had gave them to Rachel. Now we are coming to the linen. That was Uncle Edward Ward's present. How yellow it has grown! 
We children were not greatly interested in the sheets and tablecloths and pillowcases, which now came out of the capacious depths of the old blue chest, but Aunt Olivia was quite enraptured over them. What sewing, she said. Look, Janet, you'd almost need a magnifying glass to see the stitches. And the dear old-fashioned pillow slips with buttons on them. Here are a dozen handkerchiefs, said Aunt Janet. Look at the initial in the corner of each. Rachel learned that stitch from a nun in Montreal. It looks as if it was woven into the material. Here are her quilts, said Aunt Olivia. Yes, here is the blue and white counterpane Grandmother Ward gave her, and the rising sun quilt her Aunt Nancy made for her, and the braided rug. The colors are not faded one bit. I want that rug, Janet. Underneath the linen were Rachel Ward's wedding clothes. The excitement of the girls waxed red-hot over these. There was a paisley shawl in the wrappings in which it had come from the store, and a wide scarf of some yellowed lace. There was the embroidered petticoat, which had cost Felicity such painful blushes, and a dozen beautifully worked sets of the fine muslin undersleeves, which had been the fashion in Rachel Ward's youth. This was to have been her appearing out dress, said Aunt Olivia, lifting out a shot green silk. It is all cut to pieces, but what a pretty soft shade it was. Look at that skirt, Janet. How many yards must it measure around? Hoop skirts were in then, said Aunt Janet. I don't see her wedding hat here. I was always told that she packed it away too. So was I, but she couldn't have. It certainly isn't here. I have heard that the white plume on it cost a small fortune. Here's her black silk mantle. It seems like a sacrilege to meddle with these clothes. Don't be foolish, Olivia. They must be unpacked at least, and they must all be burned since they have cut so badly. This purple cloth dress is quite good, however. It can be made over nicely, and it would become you very well, Olivia. No, thank you, said Aunt Olivia with a little shudder. I should feel like a ghost. Make it over for yourself, Janet. Well, I will, if you don't want it. I am not troubled with fancies. That seems to be all except this box. I suppose the wedding dress is in it. Oh! Oh! oh. Breathed the girls, crowding about Aunt Olivia as she lifted out the box and cut the cord around it. Inside was lying a dress of soft silk that had once been white but was now yellowed with age and enfolding it like a mist, a long white bridal veil, redolent with some strange old-time perfume that had kept its sweetness through all the years. Poor Rachel Ward, said Aunt Olivia softly. Here is her point lace handkerchief. She made it herself. It is like a spider's web. Here are the letters Will Montague wrote her, and here, she added, taking a crimson velvet case with a tarnished gilt clasp, are their photographs, his and hers. We looked eagerly at the daguerreotypes in the old case. Why, Rachel Ward wasn't a bit pretty, exclaimed the story girl in poignant disappointment. No, Rachel Ward was not pretty. That had to be admitted. The picture showed a fresh young face with strongly marked irregular features, large black eyes, and black curls hanging around the shoulders in old-time style. Rachel wasn't pretty, said Uncle Alec. But she had a lovely color and a beautiful smile. She looks far too sober in that picture. She has a beautiful neck and bust, said Aunt Olivia critically. Anyhow, Will Montague was really handsome, said the story girl. A handsome rogue, growled Uncle Alec. I never liked him. I was only a little chap of ten, but I saw through him. Rachel Ward was far too good for him. We would dearly have liked to get a peep into the letters, too, but Aunt Olivia would not allow that. They must be burned unread, she declared. She took the wedding dress and veil, the picture case, and the letters away with her. The rest of the things were put back into the chest, pending their ultimate distribution. 
Aunt Janet gave each of us boys a handkerchief. The story girl got the blue candlestick, and Felicity and Cecily each got a pink and gold vase. Even Sarah Ray was made happy by the gift of a little china plate with a loudly colored picture of Moses and Aaron before Pharaoh in the middle of it. Moses wore a scarlet cloak, while Aaron disported himself in bright blue. Pharaoh was arrayed in yellow. The plate had a scalloped border with a wreath of green leaves around it. I shall never use it to eat off, said Sarah rapturously. I'll put it up on the parlor mantel place. I don't see much use in having a plate just for ornament, said Felicity. It's nice to have something interesting to look at, retorted Sarah, who felt that the soul must have food as well as the body. I'm going to get a candle for my candlestick and use it every night to go to bed with, said the story girl. And I'll never light it without thinking of poor Rachel Ward, but I do wish she had been pretty. Well, said Felicity with a glance at the clock. It's all over, and it has been very interesting, but that clock has got to be put back to the right time sometime through the day. I don't want bedtime coming a whole half hour before it ought to. In the afternoon, when Aunt Jenna was over at Uncle Roger's, seeing him and Aunt Olivia off to town, the clock was righted. The story girl and Peter came over to stay all night with us, and we made taffy in the kitchen, which the grown-ups kindly gave over to us for that purpose. Of course, it was very interesting to see the old chest unpacked, said the story girl as she stirred the contents of a saucepan vigorously. But now that it is over, I believe I am sorry that it is opened. It isn't mysterious any longer. We know all about it now and we can never imagine what things are in it any more. It's better to know than to imagine, said Felicity. Oh no, it isn't, said the story girl quickly. When you know things, you have to go by facts. But when you just dream about things, there's nothing to hold you down. You're letting the taffy scorch, and that's a fact you'd better go by, said Felicity, sniffing. Haven't you got a nose? When we went to bed, that wonderful white enchantress, the moon, was making an elf land of the snow-misted world outside. From where I lay, I could see the sharp tops of the spruces against the silvery sky. The frost was abroad, and the winds were still, and the land lay in glamour. Across the hall, the story girl was telling Felicity and Cecily the old, old tale of Argive Helen and evil-hearted Paris. But that's a bad story, said Felicity when the tale was ended. She left her husband and ran away with another man. I suppose it was bad four thousand years ago, admitted the story girl. But by this time, the bad must have all gone out of it. It's only the good that could last so long. Our summer was over. It had been a beautiful one. We had known the sweetness of common joys, the delight of dawns, the dream and glamour of noontides, the long purple peace of carefree nights. We had had the pleasure of bird song, of silver rain on greening fields, of storm among the trees, of blossoming meadows, and of the converse of whispering leaves. We had had brotherhood with wind and star, with books and tales, and hearth fires of autumn. Ours had been the little loving tasks of every day, blithe companionship, shared thoughts, and adventuring. Rich were we in the memory of those opulent months that had gone from us, richer than we then knew or suspected, and before us was the dream of spring. It is always safe to dream of spring, for it is sure to come. And if it be not just as we have pictured it, it will be infinitely sweeter. End of chapter 32 End of the Story Girl by L. M. Montgomery